Next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. And these are the only questions that will be asked today. There will be no questions from the floor. Timekeeper Carolyn Kreider, member of the League of Women Voters of Clackamas County, seated in front, will time both the questions and the responses. Thank you, Carolyn. Following the questions from our City Club panel, each candidate will ask the same two questions of each of the other candidates. Questions will be asked in 30 seconds. Responses will be one minute. The questioner will have 30 seconds for an optional rebuttal. Following the series of cross-questioning among the candidates, each candidate will have three minutes for a closing statement. The meeting is governed by the program format I've described and by the rules of conduct which are displayed on each of your tables. In consideration of our radio audience, time, and our candidates, we ask that you refrain from any applause uh, during the debate, and the program will adjourn promptly at 1.15. And now, on to our debate for State Attorney General. Our candidates today in alphabetical order are Thomas Cox of the Libertarian Party, Kevin Mannix, Republican and five-term state legislator, and Hardy Myers, the Democratic incumbent. Our candidates will now approach the podiums, and we will begin with opening statements, and we will begin, as I've mentioned, with an opening statement from Kevin Mannix, followed by Thomas Cox and Hardy Myers. Good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to be here today. In my 11 years in state office, I've never had the privilege of appearing in front of the Portland City Club. I am a frequent listener to the program on OPB, and I enjoy the interchange that occurs. As a Republican candidate for Attorney General, I think it's important to quickly get across a little bit of background information about me as a person. I've been married for 26 years, and I've been a lawyer for 26 years. I have three teenage children. My wife, Susanna, is the uh, head nurse manager at Salem Hospital in charge of intensive care and coronary care. And we both manage to juggle our responsibilities in terms of the medical world and the legal world to take care of our kids. In my five terms as a state representative, both as a conservative Democrat and then as a, as I like to say, populist Republican, I've been pleased to develop consensus with the members of the legislature on more positive bills than any other legislator. Republican or Democrat, House or Senate, bringing about positive change for Oregonians. I'm especially pleased to see that we have students from the Oregon Episcopal School here today, and I was pleased to visit with you ahead of time. And I understand they come here two or three times a year because it's important for our young people to understand, too, that folks in government have to be looking forward to the future to provide for our children. And as a legislator, I've been most concerned with protecting our society and protecting our community both now and for the long term. In this campaign for Attorney General, I have tried to emphasize my record of fighting to protect Oregonians from criminal predators and from those who carry out business scams. And yes, I have been an ardent advocate for accountability. I have fought hard for Measure 11, the mandatory minimum sentences for violent crimes, and I know you disagree with me on that, but I think it's been an important part of the 23% reduction in violent crime we've seen in the last five years. I fought hard for victims' rights, and I was pleased to sponsor Measure 40, which provided broad-based victims' rights for Oregonians in the Oregon Constitution. And that was approved by the voters in 1996. It was set aside by the Supreme Court on a technical point, the Armada decision about their new interpretation of how initiatives are carried for the Constitution. But in any event, I was proud to carry that and then recarry the issue last year by sending out referrals on various issues as to victims' rights. At the same time, I've fought hard for early intervention programs for dysfunctional families at the community level. And I was pleased to be involved last session in the Senate Bill 555 process, where we finally have gotten smart about working with families with young children that are troubled. And we've finally gotten smart about providing better early intervention programs for juveniles. 
But three minutes won't permit me the time to really talk about all aspects of this campaign. I do think it's important for me to emphasize at the beginning where Hardy Myers and I differ. It has to do with mandatory minimums and victims' rights. Those are the two areas where I have sponsored measures that he has opposed. Thank, Thank you. Mr. you. Mr. Cox? My name's Tom Cox, and I come to you as the Libertarian candidate for the Office of Attorney General. As I was greeting many of you when you came in this, into the room the, today, I heard a number of you say, which candidate are you? Which party is that? Let me tell you what it is that libertarians stand for, and that'll give you an idea of what kind of an attorney general I would be. The fundamental difference between myself and my opponents is in our view of the purpose of government. I believe it's the purpose of government to keep you safe from other people who would harm you, who might commit fraud against you, who might use force against you. I do not believe it is the purpose of government to keep you safe from yourself. We should not subsidize your mistakes. We should not protect you from your own personal flaws. My background is, as a longtime Oregonian, working in the private sector. I have worked in high technology, and I've designed computer systems for, well, e-merchandise, uh, a high-tech company here in, in the Portland area. My family is here, my wife Heather. My children were born in Portland. But I'm not a lawyer. Why would a non-lawyer want to run for attorney general? More importantly, why is it that the statute that allows the attorney general's office to exist allow a non-lawyer to run? I believe it's the purpose of the attorney general to be politically accountable to the voters. I believe it's the job of the attorney general to articulate policy and to supervise his staff. The most important job the Attorney General has, I believe, is his power to render opinions on what the laws require the state government to do, require it to refrain from doing what the law allows the state government to do. And here I differ greatly because of my philosophy of government. I would not attempt to find ways to help my friends in Salem, my longtime companions, to accomplish what they want to do. I would take a narrow view of the laws and the Constitution, and I would expect the government to live by the laws that we have passed. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Mr. Myers? Thank you uh, for the invitation to this distinguished forum. I was elected Attorney General after long private law practice and public service, including 10 years in the Oregon House and two terms as House Speaker. And in the assembly, I led on a variety of issues, including stronger criminal accountability, uh, crime victims' compensation, and judicial reform. But for a lawyer, I think no position in the government equals that of Attorney General. And because many people don't fully recognize what the office does for the people of Oregon, I'd like to highlight a few. The Attorney General is a champion of law enforcement, especially our district attorneys, in the battle for social order and public safety. The Attorney General is a champion of those who are victims of crime and of their need for support in the healing process. The Attorney General is a champion of an open and honest marketplace free of scams and frauds against individual citizens and businesses. The Attorney General is a champion of children, particularly working to see that they receive needed financial support when their parents are divorced. The Attorney General is a champion of the battle against Medicaid fraud and on behalf of the honest conduct of charities, thousands of charities. And finally, the Attorney General, as the chief lawyer for state government, is the chief independent watchdog of state government operations to ensure that they are lawful and don't infringe individual rights. 
And across all these great areas of responsibility, I have worked hard during the last four years to provide strong and mature leadership. And because of my leadership, we have made important progress in all these areas. We have, for example, attained the greatest expansion of crime victims' assistance and services in any four-year period. We have made significant improvements in our consumer protection hotline, launched the historic tobacco litigation, and processed a record number of individual consumer complaints in ever-reduced time periods. My office has also been a partner in developing a nationally recognized program that trains bank personnel to spot and report elder financial abuse. And I'm working to provide special leadership in areas like school safety and the reduction of domestic violence. As the incumbent Attorney General, I expect to be held accountable, especially by my opponents, for my record. I welcome that challenge. I regret, however, that one of my opponents, Mr. Mannix, has decided to lie about my position on criminal sentencing, and to do it in part by exploiting the Thurston High School shooting without regard to the feelings of the Springfield community in seeing Mr. Kinkle's image broadcast in a political ad. I'm going to stand up strongly against false statements about my positions on criminal sentencing. Those false ads are unworthy of a candidate of this great office, this great office and today I formally demand that he withdraw those ads. Thank you, Mr. Myers. We will now move to the portion of the program which consists of questions from our panel, and I will turn the program over to our panelists, Brad Avakian and Barbara Fredericks. Candidates will have one minute to respond to each question. There will be four rounds of questions, and the first question will come from Mr. Avakian. And the first question is to Mr. Mannix. What is the purpose of a state constitution, and how has Oregon's initiative and referendum process furthered or hindered that purpose? The purpose of the state's constitution is to provide supplemental protection as we desire it beyond the bedrock protections of the United States Constitution, which is extremely difficult to amend as it should be. In fact, it rarely is amended. The state's constitution is set up in a different system so that it can be popularly amended by the people, unlike the United States Constitution, and provides the people of the state with a direct opportunity to outline the form of government as they wish it in contemporary ways, subject always to the important and dramatic protections of the United States Constitution. I believe the initiative and referendum process is an appropriate way to amend the Oregon Constitution. We have to make sure that our population is very careful every time, though, about making an informed vote about those important changes. Mr. Cox, would you change the process for preparing ballot titles? Yes, as a matter of fact, I would. The way ballot titles are prepared now, uh, they are frequently, I believe, a vehicle for advancing the ideological agenda of the drafter, the Attorney General's office, uh, in the Secretary of State's office. It leads to, of course, a lot of expense because then the AG's office has to defend the title it's selected. I think a more appropriate approach would be to identify those people who are most keenly interested in the issue on the ballot have them gather and name an individual they can all agree on to draft a title. And if they cannot agree on an individual or if that individual cannot find a title they agree with, uh, then we may have to go with uh, something else. One idea I heard earlier from one of the other candidates, I should give credit, uh, would be a panel of retired judges who I would refer, refer it to in the event of a, a deadlock. Mr. Myers? What role should the Attorney General have in reviewing the constitutionality of proposed measures before they appear on the ballot? <clears throat> I think the role should be the one that exists now, which is to examine measures when filed for compliance with the provisions of the Oregon Constitution that govern the use of the initiative itself, uh, particularly the provisions interpreted in the Armada case that was mentioned earlier. I don't support inserting the Attorney General into a role of trying to assess the constitutionality of measures against other provisions of the Constitution when measures are first filed. Uh, if, a, if an Attorney General finds or believes or opines that a measure is unconstitutional and it's later uh, received sufficient signatures uh, to be uh, approved by the people, or to go on the ballot and is approved by the people, it'll be the Attorney General's job to defend the measure. 
uh, against constitutional challenge. And for an attorney general to assert that a measure is constitutional means that he or she is saying that there's no conceivable factual circumstance under which that measure could be unconstitutional. So I believe in the present role of the office in assessing constitutionality of measures. Mr. Mannix, <clears throat> excuse me, what early intervention strategies would you suggest as attorney general in order to prevent juvenile crime? Well, in fact, I think the early intervention has to occur before the age of five if we want to be really dramatic and smart long term. And we moved in that direction last session with Senate Bill 555, which incorporated aspects of my original Senate House Bill 2268, which built on the Hill Walker model of identifying families that are at risk, identifying kids who are dysfunctional in those families, and providing services at the community level, but allowing the communities to make the choice among the packages of identified successful strategies that they think will work best in their communities. That's going to require state funding to those communities. We need to beef up that kind of funding, but we should also let the communities make their own decisions about the most successful strategies. There is a cornucopia of available strategies if we will let the communities choose from them and if we will provide the state funding so that they can provide that help. Mr. Cox, Measure 94 on the November ballot would repeal the mandatory minimum sentences specified in Measure 11. What is your position on Measure 94, and please explain your position. I am guardedly in favor of 94 for the following reason. The, uh, the reason Measure 11 became popular and was eventually passed was because of a widespread belief, both in the legislature and among the people of Oregon, that the judiciary was usurping the power of the legislature that the judiciary was becoming excessively activist and was letting wrongdoers walk. It was the Founding Fathers' belief that with a three-part system of government, when any one branch became too big for its britches, the other two branches would gang up on it. And that's exactly what Measure 11 did. However, I don't think that's the structure we have now is sustainable in the long term. I think we need to return to judicial restraint and as a part of that, I think we need to start trusting the judges just a little more. Mr. Myers, you have stated that a priority of yours is to help victims heal. What specific programs or actions do you propose to meet this goal? Well, first of all, we are distributing ever increasing amounts of uh, both state and federal funds to sustain and expand the victims assistance programs in the district attorney's offices of the state and in the, the nonprofit service providers around the state, uh, particularly in areas of domestic violence, uh, child abuse, and sexual abuse. Uh, secondly, we have underway new, program, uh, new programs that will include, for example, creating an automated statewide victims notification system, which will, for victims who register in the program, uh, provide automatic telephone notice of key developments in his or her case. Uh, we have initiated a program of legal funding, of assistance with legal funding of services for victims of domestic violence. Uh, and we are also now providing a new program which assists homeowners with the costs of so-called cleanup from crime uh, when, for example, locks have to be changed. Mr. Mannix. In the subject of consumer protection, you have goals to promote consumer protection and to toughen consumer protection laws. What specifically will you do to meet these goals? First thing I'll do is enlist the assistance of the 95 to 98 percent of the vi businesses that are honest. I'll work with better business bureaus and chambers of commerce and local business organizations to bring in volunteers to provide mediators and investigators at the local level so that when we get a consumer protection complaint in Salem, we can immediately direct that out to the local community so a person on the spot, a trained volunteer, can go out, gather the information, and report back what has transpired so that we can quickly mediate resolution if this is an honest mistake or if something dishonest has happened, we can quickly gather enough information to let the hammer fall on that dishonest business. Mr. Cox, several states have filed suit against the gun industry to pay for damages associated with their product, much like what has been done with tobacco. Do you support such action? Well, 
if we're going to invent a new theory of liability that says that the manufacturer of an object is responsible for the evil spirits that are, are living in it that cause it to commit crimes, uh, I think we need to hold the manufacturer accountable for both the positives and the negatives. Uh, since five times more crimes are prevented by an armed victim than are committed by an armed criminal, clearly we owe the gun makers money. So, to answer your direct question, do I support suing the gun makers? Uh, no, actually, I don't. I believe that those who choose to commit crimes have free will and should be held accountable for their crimes. I don't think that the law should be used to shake down companies with deep pockets, and I don't think it should be used as an end run around the legislature. That's where you should make policy, not in the courtroom. Mr. Myers, what can the Attorney General do to keep pace with rapidly changing technologies such as internet commerce or genetic engineering that may pose risks to consumers? We have formed an internet uh, fraud uh, working group uh, within our consumer protection section which is intended first of all to help develop uh, greater expertise uh, among the attorneys and staff who are working to combat that particular area of fraud. And I have named Internet fraud as one of our four highest priorities for action. Uh, secondly, we are expanding our efforts to advance the education of the public around potential Internet fraud through publications, particularly with uh, concentration on issues like identity theft, uh, but also to try to alert the public with respect to the dangers to children that are posed by the Internet, uh, particularly through the chat rooms. Uh, these are the principal efforts that we are mounting now, and we are attempting, along with that, to assist in the expansion of the training of law enforcement in the investigation uh, and the workup of cases involving Internet fraud. That is one of the really desperate short, 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 shortages we now have in law enforcement is trained personnel who can deal with computer crime. Mr. Mannix, what would be your policy on enforcing environmental regulations in light of your initial vote on House Bill 5019, which would have cut funding for the Department of Environmental Quality? I think the real enforcement belongs first in the community and with support from the Attorney General's office. The most important enforcement has to do with connecting up with that community, and I'll use the Port of Portland as an example. We have had a failed environmental policy with the Port of Portland. The Attorney General's office has failed to provide leadership in bringing DEQ together with the business community, the City of Portland, and Multnomah County so that we can get moving on the cleanup of the Portland Harbor because they've been arguing about liability when the first goal of the environmental protection laws is cleanup and protection of the environment. And if we get back to the first goal, I think an attorney general can be successful in bringing about compliance by partnering with those businesses out there who want to help clean up the environment and not spending 20 years in litigation, which is the track we're on now, arguing about who's going to clean up the harbor. Let's get it cleaned up now, and that's where the attorney general has to provide leadership. Mr. Cox, without formal legal education specifically, how would you run the Attorney General's office whose primary purpose is the enforcement and interpretation of state law? I am so glad you asked me that. One of my first acts will be to form an executive committee consisting of the heads of the various departments and three volunteer attorneys from outside the department who will help me provide the direct oversight necessary to run the department. In addition, I would refer you to ORS 180.140 which says that the Attorney General, and I quote, uh, will appoint other assistants who shall be responsible, f I'm sorry, will have the full authority under the direction of the Attorney General to perform any duty required by law to be performed by the Attorney General himself. Uh, clearly, I would assign uh, appropriate uh, members of the bar to handle the direct day-to-day uh, uh, -day operations of the office. Mr. Myers, <clears throat> Measure 2 on the November ballot would create a process for citizens to petition the legislature to review administrative rules. What would be the role of the Attorney General if Measure 2 passes? It would be twofold. Uh, first, to defend the measure uh, if it is subject to any kind of judicial challenge. Uh, and secondly, and perhaps uh, more importantly and more uh, profoundly, it is to 
uh, counsel with and guide any affected part of the government as to how to comply with the measure, uh, how to follow the measure uh, in terms of any requirements it imposes. And that would be advice that would be focused primarily on the Legislative Assembly, I believe. Mr. Mannix, as Attorney General, you would review proposed ballot measures to meet the requirements of a single subject rule. Do you agree with the recent interpretations of the single subject rule? And if not, how does your interpretation differ? I'm concerned about the movement of the interpretations of the single subject rule because I'm afraid that pretty soon you'll be able to find that a one sentence constitutional amendment potentially affects two provisions somewhere in our Oregon Constitution, and it'll be very hard for any constitutional amendment to be initiated by the voters as opposed to referred by the legislature. I would prefer to have the legislature establish a statutory process for single subject review ahead of time and have a precise process independent of the Attorney General's office because the Attorney General has to defend that measure if it passes. I would advocate for that independent process, have it established, have it clear cut, and that way you do have an independent review ahead of time outside of the political world and outside of the Attorney General's office who again must defend the measure if it later passes. Mr. Cox, what role should the Attorney General's office play in the prevention and reduction of domestic violence? Unfortunately, we are entering an era where I believe we expect the government to solve every problem, where any bad thing that shows up on the news uh, is grist for a move for further empowerment of the government, uh, that anything that goes wrong should have been intercepted and prevented beforehand. Uh, I have dreadful news for you. Even the most powerful government in the world can't stop bad things from happening. However, there are some things we can do. A lot of domestic violence honestly comes from the breakup of the family, which has in turn come from government meddling throughout the 60s and 70s. And well, that's a little out of scope for the Attorney General. The things we can do, however, I'm going to pass on that. I'm Over to him. And Mr. Myers. Should there be enhanced sentences for hate crimes, please explain why or why not. I support enhanced sentencing for hate crimes as a way of registering an extra response from the community, disapproval by the community of that particular motivation for criminal action. Uh, I think that in terms of our state law, however, we have, I believe, uh, uh, addressed the issue uh, reasonably satisfactorily. I'm certainly open, however, to the argument that further change may be needed. But at least we have, we have established in our state law uh, our extra disapproval, I think, of hate uh, as a motivator for violent conduct. I'd like to thank our panelists at this time. During our next portion of the program, each candidate will ask the same two questions of the other two candidates. Candidates will have one minute to respond after which the questioner will have an optional 30-second rebuttal. And we will begin the questioning with Mr. Mannix, Mr. Cox, and Mr. Myers will respond in that order. My first question is, I've heard from one of the candidates that the Attorney General should be champion of law enforcement. If that's true, uh, shouldn't voters vote for me since I'm the only candidate endorsed by the five uniformed law enforcement organizations across this state? And over to me. Uh, well, last I checked, uh, people running for public office were not selected by a cabal of law enforcement officers. That's the sort of thing that's done in Chile. <laughs> Please refrain. And I think that pretty well covers my answer. <laughs> Line. Line law enforcement organizations, just as was true four years ago, have indeed endorsed my opponent. I think they like his style better than mine, to be honest with you. But I'm running with the endorsement of every district attorney in this state who has made an endorsement, just as I was four years ago when my opponent and I were running in the Democratic primary against each other. And I have the support of a number of individual sheriffs, chiefs of police, members of the law enforcement community, apart from organizational positions, as well as the Council of Firefighters. 
So I'm very proud of the support that I have uh, in the law enforcement community. They know how strong my commitment has been to public safety and how long I have worked on issues surrounding public safety, beginning with the first term in the legislature. Mr. Re Mannix, rebuttal. rebuttal. Yes, they do know his record, and that's why they have endorsed me. And I have to add to that in terms of the DAs, 14 DAs out of 36 have not endorsed the incumbent attorney general. And when I run for re-election in four years, not only will uniformed law enforcement, but all the DAs will endorse me for re-election because they know I will be committed to the cause of public safety, protecting you and your families from criminal predators, whether it be property criminals or violent criminals. Mr. Cox, your question, Mr. Myers will answer first. A uh, quick reminder, I have how long to ask the question? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, I can do that. Mr. Myers, you signed on to the tobacco settlement in which you sold out the rule of law in exchange for some $90 million a year for the state. In the process, you usurped the legislature's power for both setting public policy and levying taxes. And you trampled on several principles of law. These include the idea that laws are defined in advance and not applied retroactively, that damages are paid proportional to past wrongs, paid by wrongdoers, and paid to those wronged. None of these is the case here, where so-called damages are proportional to future sales, must be paid by companies that didn't exist in the past and are received not by smokers, but by a government that already turns a profit on tobacco. Mr. Cox, that is your time. Well, first of all, the national settlement, uh, which is historic, of course, is an agreement. Uh, it's not the imposition of law by anyone. It's an agreement to which the industry uh, entered into with the various suing states and territories. And the reason that it's historic is not the money part of it, although that's important. Uh, and I hope we'll be able to get that issue back into the legislature and to reject the two measures before you this time that prescribe to lock up that money. Uh, the reason the agreement is historic is for its non-economic provisions which for the first time have committed the industry in, in contract, if you will, to attempt to move into more responsible channels of advertising and marketing, and have given us a legal basis on which to respond with enforcement actions if we believe that the industry's advertising and marketing is targeting youth. And smoking in this country is a youth habit. It is a pediatric disease. Very few people start smoking as adults. So the ability to respond to youth targeting is critical to the, to the reduction of adult smoking. Mr. Mannix? Stop the presses, hold the wires, because I happen to agree with Hardy Myers on this, and I defend his action in joining in the National Tobacco Settlement, which started out with the National Tobacco Litigation. I think he did the right thing. I want to emphasize that that National Tobacco Litigation was initiated by a Mississippi Attorney General who said that as Attorney General of Mississippi, he represented all the people, and he was gutsy enough and just yes, activist enough to start that case in court and to raise the issues about the depredations of the tobacco companies. So God bless him for doing it, and yes, thank you, Hardy Myers, for joining in. In other words, Mr. Myers, you are the kind of activist Attorney General you would warn us against in your ads. <laughs> I don't think it's appropriate to use the rule of law as a way to shake down companies with deep pockets who happen to be unpopular. The tobacco settlement ties the hands not only of those companies that did wrong in the past, but any company that should come into existence in the future. That's nonsense. Mr. Myers, your question of your candidate. Uh, will you or will you not defend Oregon's assisted suicide law if it is attacked by the federal government? Mr. Mannix? Yes. Yeah, in fact, I think Brent Huntsberger, the Oregonian, got off into my interpretations. I was talking about tactics, not strategy. Um, I believe in the initiative process. I believe in the rule of law in Oregon. And even though I am personally opposed and will remain adamantly personally opposed to physician-assisted suicide, I will do my darndest as attorney general to uphold the rule of law on that and on other social issues where I'm in disagreement. Because I am not running for the legislature, I'm not running for governor, I'm running for attorney general. And it's the attorney general's job to apply the law as passed by the citizens. And I promise you that as to physician-assisted suicide, the issue is not 
whether you defend it, but how. And I've tried to make the point that attacking the pharmaceutical regulation issue may not be as smart as looking at our common law authority to regulate physician-patient relationships. That may be the smarter, better way to defend physician-assisted suicide because that is traditionally in the United States within the purview of the states, whereas ph pharmaceutical regulations are more within the purview of the federal government. Mr. Cox? Yes, I would most assuredly defend it. I would cast your minds back to my opening comments. It is not the purpose of government to protect us from ourselves. If you are not clinically depressed, if you for whatever reason have decided that it is time for you to leave and you wish to kill yourself, I would like to talk you out of it, but I will not stop you. It is not an appropriate thing for the government to be doing. The federal constitution has something called the Tenth Amendment, which reserves rights to the states and to the people, and I would use that, among other things, to fight any federal encroachment on the rights of Oregonians. The Attorney General takes an oath to support the constitution and laws of the state of Oregon, and I think it is incumbent upon any Attorney General, of course, to follow that oath, regardless of personal feelings. I am an opponent of physician-assisted suicide as well, but I believe it is an incumbent responsibility of the office uh, to challenge the constitutionality of any federal legislation if it seeks to set aside the Oregon law. And I had understood, Mr. Mannix, that uh, you did not intend to do that. And if you are now saying that you are, I would understand that to be a change of your position. No, that's just the way the Oregonian reports things sometimes. Mr. Mannix, Sorry. your second question of your opponents, Mr. Cox, will respond first. Switching to drunk driving, I'd like to ask both candidates, beginning with Mr. Cox. Last session, I sponsored a repeat drunk driver felony sentencing law, which finally brings accountability to people after their third conviction for drunk driving, by not only pulling them off the road, but just saying, we've had enough and we will put them behind bars. Now, Mr. Myers did not assist me in pushing through that legislation last session. Mr. Cox, what is your position on that legislation? And Mr. Myers, why didn't you assist in getting that bill through? Operating vehicles on the public roads is a privilege, not a right. And certainly, if I were to, by analogy, take a revolver, load one chamber, spin it, put it to your head, and click, I didn't hurt you. So you can't act against me. Every time a drunk driver gets behind the wheel, it's the same thing. We want to wait three clicks of that hammer before we pull him off the road. I support the idea of holding drunk drivers and everyone else accountable for their actions. You cannot tell me that you were drunk and therefore weren't thinking straight. You were sober when you started drinking. Mr. Myers. <clears throat> Representative Mannix, uh, I am not involved with every measure before the assembly. And if I recall correctly, it was my impression or understanding that that bill had ample support and was not going to have difficulty with passage. I certainly was not involved because it's not an issue I've been interested in. Uh, in my first legislative session, I was the leader of the fight to reduce the prima facie drinking uh, blood count level from 0.15 to 0.08. I was the leader in the legislature of the, uh, to defeat the proposal to reduce the drinking age from 21 to 18. I wish I could say I had succeeded in doing that. Uh, unfortunately, it was the death of Steve Prefontaine that killed that bill in the legislature. But I have worked on behalf of a number of different measures in the assembly uh, in relation to the problem of drunk driving, uh, and it remains, of course, a commitment of mine uh, in this office. Well, actually, I'm glad to know after the fact that it was so sure that the bill was going to go through, but I had to sweat bullets to get that bill through Ways and Means, and it would have been helpful to have help from the Attorney General's office. I certainly had wonderful support from the Governor's Commission on Drunk Driving, which made that bill their number one priority, and I wished you had participated in that process. We had to make some negotiations about intermediate sanctions that I think could have been tougher, but we didn't have enough support to get those through, and I think it could have made a difference. Mr. Cox, your second question of your opponents, Mr. Myers will answer first. In fairness, I didn't help with that legislation either. <laughs> uh, the Oregon Constitution in the Bill of Rights, Section 16, reads in part, 
that the jury, and I quote, shall have the right to determine the law and the facts. This is an unusual thing in Oregon. Uh, other states don't do that. We allow juries to decide both the law and the facts in criminal cases. However, judges don't allow juries to know that. Would you act? I believe the Constitution is being correctly interpreted and applied by our courts at this time. Mr. Mannix? Since 1859, the interpretation by the courts has been consistent with Mr. Meyer's interpretation, and I agree with that interpretation. Um, there is a distinction between allowing the jurors to be instructed in what the existing law is and to allow them to apply that law to the facts. And the traditional language of the Constitution has been traditionally interpreted as to the role of the judge and the jury. And I have no problem with the existing system where the jurors are the determinants of the facts and they are instructed in the law as established by the vote of the people or by the vote of the Legislative Assembly. Jury nullification has a long history, I think a good one. And I believe that an examination of the Constitutional Convention of Oregon will show anyone who cares to look at it that my interpretation is correct, that this is intended to be an empowerment of juries, not of judges. By siding with the judges, I am afraid uh, my opponents uh, part company with me. Mr. Myers, your second question of your opponents. Mr. Mannix will respond first. Where does the majority of your campaign financing come from? And have any independent expenditures in support of you been made? If so, how much? And do you anticipate future independent expenditures and how much? I have not requested nor relied upon any independent expenditures. In fact, I have encouraged anybody who supports my campaign to work with me through Citizens for Mannix. Uh, we're located in Salem, and I've been a actively reaching out to anyone who wants to participate in my campaign. And we have filed reports showing that a vast majority of business people in this state have supported my candidacy. I am proud to have support from the business community. I think they understand the importance of this office. Mr. Cox. The majority of my financing has come out of my back pocket. And to the best of my knowledge, there's been no third parties spending money on my behalf. Uh, if there are, God bless you. <laughs> Rebuttal. I would only, <clears throat> I would only say that I'm extremely proud that as of this point, uh, we have about a thousand contributors to my campaign, uh, my candidacy across the spectrum of both the bar and outside the bar and the business community and the organizations. Uh, and I'm very pleased that breadth of support, uh, which follows a similar breadth of support four years ago. Thank you, candidates. We will now move to the final portion of today's program, three-minute closing statements from each of our candidates. The order for closing statements was determined by a separate drawing of numbers last week. We will begin with Mr. Myers, followed by Mr. Cox, and conclude with Mr. Mannix. Mr. Myers. When I first ran for the legislature in 1974, uh, the most popular bumper sticker, political bumper sticker in the country said, uh, defeat all incumbents and lawyers. Unfortunately, the people of my legislative district uh, ignored that advice, or I would not be here today, I'm sure. And why did the bumper sticker call for the defeat of all lawyer candidates? Because 1974 was the culminating year of Watergate. And Watergate was a scandal dominated by lawyers, from the President of the United States to the lowest level. And from that time, I resolved to conduct myself in public life uh, to bring honor to my profession and to serve an office in a way that does not disappoint or betray the expectations of the people. Now, I have worked tirelessly to that end in all the public positions I have held, in the legislature, in important appointed positions under three governors, and as attorney general. And as long as I am privileged to hold public office, I will continue to work tirelessly not to betray the people's trust. And during this campaign, the media have drawn a sharp contrast between my style and that of one of my opponents, Mr. Mannix. 
The contrast may be somewhat overdrawn, but there is no question that we are different. I reject, however, my opponent's efforts to portray me as a passive manager and soft on crime. My four years as Attorney General have been years of work and achievement all across the mission areas of the great department I head. And that is why I am endorsed by every district attorney who has publicly spoken on this race, as I was four years ago. Endorsed by the Firefighters Council, the organizations like the League of Conservation Voters and Basic Rights Oregon. Endorsed by many public and private labor organizations representing thousands of working Oregonians. And finally, I'm endorsed by the editorial boards of great newspapers like the Salem Statesman Journal, the Eugene Register Guard, the Daily Astorian, and the Oregonian, which summed up the race this way. So much for being passive, as Myers is sometimes described. What Myers really is, for a politician, is modest. He's not good about trumpeting his office's accomplishments, but they are real. I'm eager to continue my public service and would be honored if the people of Oregon will entrust me once again with the office of their Attorney General. Mr. Cox, your closing statement. When I first told a friend of mine some time ago that I was going to run for Attorney General, I was surprised to receive a gift from her. It's a t-shirt with a quote from Shakespeare, uh, Henry VI, Part Two. It's the one where the one character says, first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. What people forget is the context of the quote, the person speaking it is laying a plot to institute tyranny. I believe that lawyers form the bulwark, the first best defense against tyranny and for liberty in our state and our country. We mentioned ads earlier. I, I want to digress for a moment and say that I will not air any ads misrepresenting either of my opponent's positions. I pledge that to you now. The point I would leave you with is that there is no such thing as a wasted vote. People will tell you, oh, you vote for Tom. You're really voting for the guy you don't want. That's not true. The only waste is to not vote at all. If you vote for me, then the loser of this election is going to look at all the votes he left on the table because he didn't take my positions, and he's going to wonder how he can get them next time. If you vote for me because you agree with me, then you're sending a signal to everybody in the state. And if you don't agree with me, for heaven's sake, don't vote for me. Vote your conscience. The surest way to lose your liberty is not to use it. Mr. Mannix. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I know that this is just the last three minutes in which I can make some closing remarks. I want to emphasize that there is a difference between Hardy and myself. I have said throughout the campaign that Hardy is a good man, but I've also said that his approach to the job has been one of a manager, and he may not agree with my interpretation. But to me, a general is a leader. A general is somebody with vision. A general is somebody who finds the problems and finds the solutions. And when Hardy left the legislature and gave us sentencing guidelines, left it sitting there, we had an eight and a half average year sentence for murder. We had a two and a half year average sentence for rape. And he wants to say, well, it was resource driven. That's OK. He wants to say, I voted for it. That's right. As a freshman Democrat, I voted for it. And I said at the time, we need to bring resources online. The leadership promised to do it. And guess what? We came back in 1991, and the leadership failed to deliver because a combination of politicians who were too weak and too cheap didn't want to do anything about it. So we came back in the 1993 session, and I brought in bills to say, let's modify sentencing guidelines. Let's give them some guts, some spine, some justice. And still the leadership wouldn't move the legislation. They stuck their heads in the sand. So as a leader myself, I turned to the citizens, and I sponsored Measure 11. I got the signatures. I circulated the petitions. I got it on the ballot. I got it passed. 66% of the people of this state said we're fed up with violent crime and we're going to hold those criminals accountable. And God bless those voters. And where was Hardy Myers? 
He didn't say, well, yes, we need to do something about those weak sentencing guidelines that were there. Here's, some, here's another proposal. Here's an alternative. He opposed Measure 11, and he has to this day never said that Measure 11 was a good thing. He's simply against the repeal going back retroactively because it's inconvenient and it's difficult for witnesses. Turn to victims' rights. We never had a constitutional amendment guaranteeing victims' rights. I couldn't get the legislature to refer one out, so I worked with prosecutors and I wrote one. We sent it out to the voters and they passed it, Measure 40. Hardy opposed Measure 40. So there is a difference. I believe in protecting Oregonians. I believe government has a role in protecting us in our families, in our streets, and in our schools. I believe the Attorney General needs to be a leader in bringing these kinds of issues forward. And I believe that my opponent, the incumbent, my primary opponent, has a more restricted view of the job. I ask you to take a look at my vision and my commitment to this process and to support me in my effort to make everybody's homes safer, to make everybody's families safer in years to come. That is why I'm running for Attorney General. Thank you. On behalf of the City Club of Portland and the League of Women Voters, I'd like to thank all three of our candidates for participating in today's debate. Special thanks to all of our audiences, those of you who are with us today, and also those who will be listening later in the week on radio and who will be watching the rebroadcast on cable television. We are adjourned.